And now to shed more light on the investment philosophy and the team behind equity, I would like to invite Mr. Shiv Segal, President and Head Institutional Securities at Edelweiss. In this role, Shiv provides leadership to one of India's largest equity franchises and is responsible for the capital markets businesses, which includes institutional equities covering sales, research and trading, as well as asset services. Shiv has worked in the investment management and financial services industry for close to two decades, the majority of which has been spent in emerging market funds in the Pan-Asia markets. Prior to his current role, Shiv led the Goldman Sachs Institutional Sales Trading Equity Capital Markets business in India and was responsible for the firm's franchise relationships. So with that, let me hand over to Shiv Segal to tell us more about our institutional capabilities and the investment philosophy behind iEquity. Over to you, Shiv. Thanks, Sapna, for that kind introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, thanks for your time, uh, especially on a Friday afternoon, uh, which has been uh, a very volatile uh, week so far. Um, so I guess, you know, everyone wants to hear our thoughts. And one is on, on Litton gave, Nitin gave you a little bit of a introduction on the product itself. And Devan, uh, Shiv Devan, who's my colleague, uh, will be giving you a little bit more insight onto how uh, we at the investment committee and, uh, you know, the, the thought process behind how we evaluate stocks and why we think this is the right time to be investing uh, in such a product. But before I get into that, I just wanted to, you know, structure my thoughts, uh, one on the product and two also on the broader uh, thesis at play uh, or the current state of play in markets currently, which I'm sure a lot of you would be interested. And uh, so I'll speak for a few minutes, uh, share some charts and some insights on the markets. Uh, we'll get Devan introduced into the conversation as well. And uh, then we leave ample time for some Q&A, um, given the fact that uh, such a large audience has, has especially a niche audience, has, has <clears throat> taken out the time to listen to us. So let me start by begin by saying that, you know, we all know the low risk uh, route to compounding wealth, uh, especially in the equity markets, has been by buying a portfolio of great companies whose fundamentals are resilient and healthy even during periods of, uh, you know, stress in the external environment. Um, as we saw probably uh, at the beginning of the of the pandemic, and uh, you know such companies, if you happen to choose them over a long period of time, not only accelerate the rate of market share gains uh, from their weaker companies uh, in the industry, uh, but more importantly in India, you know we have seen a lot of this happening globally. But what has transpired in India, especially in the regulatory change environment that we've been in in the last three years, uh, you know with GST, corporate tax rate cards, demon. You know, it has only helped accelerate uh, future earnings growth potential of a niche set of companies uh, and by creating a snowball effect for their revenue share. And we believe uh, that once they go through such companies that go through our rigorous checklist, both in terms of, you know, fundamental qualities and quantitative factors, and we have about 10 or 12 bunch of them, uh, you know, I think it can result in a lot of wealth creation uh, for clients and investors. And uh, just to give you a little bit more insight, Nitin spoke briefly about the fact that how earnings uh, in India have started uh, or, you know, started seeing some green shoots. But I am a avid student of history and I'll just kind of, uh, you know, talk to you a little bit about why earnings are starting to see uh, show up uh, in terms of, you know, at least in the large cap and some of the quality companies that we have chosen as well. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share a couple of charts regarding that as well. But just before I get to that, you know, our investment strategy in I equity, the thesis is very simple. We have tried to keep it as basic as possible uh, and strong to the core of what we do in our fundamental research analysis uh, for institutional clients as well. 
you know, we choose quality companies with solid fundamentals and long-term sustainable business models, right? We believe in systematic and disciplined approach based on the best factors of these in-house proprietary models that we have. The pillars of investment in our, in our portfolio are basically earnings momentum, earnings quality and market leadership. And, uh, you know, if you look at the corporate profits in the Nifty, 70% of profits are generated by 30% of the companies in India. And that's been a stat that's been probably be go, growing larger and larger. Uh, it's kind of similar in, in the developed markets as well, as we have seen with what's happened in the FANGs, uh, not only in terms of gaining market share, but also in terms of gaining uh, you know, the market cap share that has translated because of the fact they're gaining maximum eyeballs and maximum uh, revenue market share from, from weaker competitors. And that same thesis is playing out in most of the industries in India where the top two players are dominant uh, in every aspect. And <clears throat> this in-depth bottom-up uh, thought process that we have, you know, it helps us kind of filter out the low quality companies and build out a moat of very strong companies and a portfolio of about 15, 20 companies in our core portfolio. We have two variants uh, of the product. Uh, one is our core and one is our growth. And the only differentiating factor between the two is that in the growth portfolio, we also kind of overlay that with our best conviction calls in the mid cap space. So if I had to kind of break up in, a, in a, any given year, you would look at about 15 to 20 stocks in the core portfolio and about 20 to 25 stocks in the uh, growth portfolio. And the whole idea behind this is that we are going to look at it from a very long term basis. So please don't enter the product and look at it from a quarterly, weekly, monthly uh, performance perspective. The whole idea behind this product view is that we are trying to capture an entire business cycle as any investment should. So it is a very long-term uh, thought process. And the reality is that we are gonna also have a very low churn portfolio, right? I don't think uh, as actually it's in our mandate that we will not have more than 15 to 20% of the portfolio churn in any given year. And another aspect that takes out the individual biases uh, from this particular product is the fact that, you know, it is a very investment committee approach uh, based view. Um, we have, you know, veterans in the industry who have worked for 20, 25 years, all part of the investment committee, uh, which relates to a very healthy debate uh, when a portfolio manager or someone pitches a stock, right? And it's, it basically takes out the personal biases and kind of takes your conviction level very high as to why it should make it to the cut uh, in the equity portfolio. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a very skilled and talented uh, set of people, which adds to our advantage. Um, and I think uh, that is definitely a, this is definitely a product that is aimed to design and deliver, uh, you know, over a business cycle. And the, and the reason I'm re-emphasizing that is that, unfortunately, given the environment that we are in, uh, people are too fixated on, you know, monthly and quarterly performances. Yes, they are important and, our, and our, uh, you know, our endeavor is to beat that. But what I'm saying is that I think this portfolio should be judged over a long period of cycle. Having said that, it has been a great start to the product. Uh, we delivered in calendar year 20, uh, about 30.2% or 30.8% uh, in, our, in our growth portfolio versus the 100, which was up about 100%. <clears throat> so, you know, Devan will talk a lot about on the, on the investment process, how we kind of gauge at our end as well. But I wanted to kind of, you know, talk a lot about the fact that why India is going through this uh, cycle where last quarter you saw foreigners pump in about $23 billion in India. And in the emerging markets, we are probably, uh, you know, the number one uh, in favor uh, country at the moment. It may not feel like today, given what market has done in India today and in the region. But the reality is that if you look at, you know, 10 years, 15 years back when BRICS came into formation, you know, we had Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, and I think uh, Brazil has been a basket case uh, in the last, uh, you know, recent history. Uh, the Brazilian real has depreciated the worst in the emerging markets as well. Uh, Russia is very much dependent on oil and is very highly correlated to oil. And uh, India and China have probably been the two main, uh, you know, who have taken the lead within the BRICS. And in, within emerging markets, India actually has stood out because of the fact that during COVID, uh, what the government has done and, and, and the fiscal expansion, the way they managed it, uh, you know, the foreigners have taken a, a very favorable outcome to that. And, and the fact that our economy is bouncing back and we're seeing green shoots in not only in the rural space, but uh, majority of sectors, that's kind of out playing out in our, in our uh, earnings department as well. And this 
earnings season was actually been a blowout you know nitin talked about a lot of companies uh, giving 30 40% uh, earnings growth and i think that that trajectory has changed uh, from we have come a long way you know 2003 to 2008 uh we had the golden golden era in india along with emerging markets uh global growth was you know in in full steam china was kicking double digit gdp growth and that was leading to a lot of optimism and uh, uh you know boom time in india as well and if i compare from what transpired from 2008 2010 post gfc which is the global financial crisis you know we were at almost at par with the us our corporate profitability in india as a percentage of gdp was almost at about 7.2 7.5% and uh, us was about 7% in 2008 2009 while in the next 10 15, 10 12 years you know indian corporate profitability has gone from uh, a peak of 7.5% to a absolute all time low of about 2% at the beginning of 2020 you know us went from 6.8 to 13.8% and this last two quarters we have seen that corporate profitability come back and that is what uh, you know that optimism is being reflected in not only the domestic equity markets but also the fact that uh, the foreigners are starting to see that and as i mentioned you know they they pumped in 23 billion dollars last uh, quarter as well um so if i were to just kind of you know i have a presentation so i don't don't want to just make this a monologue uh, let me just quickly share some screens with you which will talk about uh, what i am saying this one second you know most of you have already been emailed uh, this pitch deck as well uh, i don't want to go through uh, everything so i'm going to jump to the parts where you know this is talks a lot about our investment philosophy our investment process uh, and devan will talk a little bit about that you know this is our uh, core and uh, equity growth the two variants we have in the product um and what i really wanted to kind of focus on in this conversation that's our performance and you know i'm skipping through in the paucity of time but what i really wanted to get into involved was on the market outlook right and this is where if you look at it uh, in terms of nifty earnings spot lines right and we have done a lot of work on this and the three d's that i would like to mention is the deflation disruption and <clears throat> our defaults right so the reason last 10 years we saw 80% on nifty uh, earnings erode was because of the fact that we saw deflation in the commodity space Uh, our metals energy and export auto sectors were decimated uh, from about you know the last 6 7 years uh, we saw a lot of disruption in the it pharma and telecom space uh, you know telecom you all know i mean you know what jio has done jio came into the market it disrupted uh, completely the entire ecosystem uh, you know and basically we have three telecom players today and what we are seeing is that the disruption that happened with arpu is kind of going at the bottom the last uh, couple of months we have seen prices prices going up and become stable pharma with the pandemic came back with a with a big bang and we are continuing to see that uh, you know play out quite well even this coincided with the fact in the last couple of years a lot of uh, generic patents uh, you know expired in the us and that has been a very beneficial to the pharma sector in india and in terms of defaults you know last couple of years india saw especially i would say from 2010 you know we we started off with the npas going berserk in the psu banks and that kind of you know helped uh, the private sector a lot and hdfc bank and cotex and and you know access gained a lot of market share but since the ilfs crisis that impacted and the nbfc crisis that impacted you know corporate profitability for banks also was a was a big uh, game changer in india that disrupted earnings but as we look today right uh, we are seeing so that's just talking about uh, the disruption in in defaults as a percentage of uh, earnings but the reason what i wanted to speak to you was you know nifty earnings are likely, likely to see a massive rebound in the next couple of years because it has not only been the fact that last 10 years or last 7 years we have seen a big disruption but the entire uh, cycle right has changed we are seeing it come back as we all are aware uh, and we are seeing the auto export the commodity cycle come back the reflation theme is on uh we are starting to see yields pick up and there has not been much investment in lot of these uh you know out of favor sectors as well and that is why the operating leverage and earnings margin are very high for some of the cyclical sectors and of course devan is going to speak a little bit more on it but i just want to kind of correlate to what makes our thesis on the fact that we are so bullish in india right strong global liquidity suggests a lot more upside uh this 
to me, I think we've, I've spoken in a lot of seminars and we all know about the stats, the trillions of dollars being pumped in. Um, yes, yields are spiking up, uh, but the reality is that you know, central banks are on a path where they will continue to pump in money on any jitters. Uh, Jeremy Powell was you know, um, up in arms uh, just last Wednesday, uh, saying that when you know, he was asked categorically, what is his view on inflation? And uh, he said the Fed is not even thinking of thinking about raising rates. So I think we are in a very low and benign world. Yes, the inflation theme is on and 10-year yields are spiking up. And you know, there are a lot of charts floating around today that S&P yield uh, is uh, you know, 1.5%. And you know, as we break above uh, the 10, 10 years break above 1.5%, uh, there'll be a lot of rebalancing from equities into the bond portfolio. But let me categorically tell you that as 10 years kind of approach 1.75, our view is that uh, the Fed will kind of implement some sort of uh, yield, curve, yield curve controls and uh, you know that will pro probably get the animal spirits back on again. Um, and all markets are looking for are you know, benign comments uh, from the Fed governors and any jitters that are caused uh, by any equity pullbacks. And yes, we are frothy. You know, there are a lot of elements at the moment uh, that can come off like cryptocurrencies, SPACs in the US and EVs. But the reality is that the earnings are matching up, right? And uh, markets, in our perspective, you know, we, we kind of, these are our proprietary tools. We look at earnings stagger, global liquidity, US 10 year real rates, <clears throat> macro vulnerabilities. You know, we don't think that we are in an environment uh, that should cause us uh, any grave concerns at the moment. What would transpire and make us worried would be if 10 year yields kind of break above 1.75% and there is no yield curve control from, from the Fed. But the likely scenario that I would put on that is probably 0% at the moment. Uh, let's not forget that the government, the US government and the central banks also have to, um, you know, look at their fiscal deficits and any marginal movement in the 10 years and 30 year yields will cause a big uh, deficit hole in their budgets as well. So, you know, in terms of uh, the one narrative that I wanted to talk about, right, is that there are a lot of green shoots happening. Uh, credit costs for the banks, uh, you know, had been at elevated levels. If you look at just the 10-year yields in India, we have gone from, you know, a peak of 8.2% uh, in 2018 to, as they stand today, 6.2%. That Yes, they've grown up, uh, gone up by 50 bips, but, you know, we are still far off from, from the peak. And I don't think, uh, and Nintan mentioned that, you know, RBI has done a fantastic job. And I think that OMO operations will continue. Uh, easing liquidity will continue. Um, and that provides a big kicker to, uh, to the BFSI space as well. And I genuinely believe that in India, uh, easing liquidity is, is kind of the number one uh, factor that will propel not only real estate, uh, the financials, uh, the NBFC space, but you know the <clears throat> capital growth that India needs, India is a capital starved nation, uh, will be a big, big kicker. Um, I also, uh, you know, before I jump in into this, let me just stop and uh, share this and we'll come back to this. Um, a lot of, Alok had asked me in particular, uh, a lot of people would be interested to know how we see the world playing out in the next couple of months, right? Um, one is for the fact that we feel that nifty earnings, uh, we will see at least 20, 20 to 25% year on year growth for the next two years. You know, on the upside, we might even see 25%, uh, which is definitely achievable. But more importantly, how we see the global macro outlook, um, I think the COVID backdrop continues to improve uh, over March and April. The pandemic uh, impact, in my mind, uh, would be over by May. That's not to say that the virus will disappear, but instead it will become endemic. It will not be pandemic. Uh, and it will be much more manageable. Uh, vaccination is improving at a very, very fast pace uh, in the developed world. In India, it was it is also gathering very very big momentum. Um, on the stimulus side, as I mentioned, you know Biden already when he came back, he gave the 900 billion stimulus. Uh, the paychecks are already out in the U.S. I think the bigger one will be the 1.6 trillion stimulus that he's talked about. I think that happens by April. And also, let's not forget uh, the Build Back Better infrastructure plan that the U.S. is planning, and that's going to be about 2.5 trillion dollars. Of course, it's over 10 years, but the sentiment impact of that will be big for the US and, and, and the global growth as well. Um, as I mentioned, my view is that treasury yields continue to grind higher, but what that does in impact is that the 
key expansion that we have seen in global uh, equity markets will take a little bit of a pause at the moment right there will be a consolidation as we approach between 1.5 to 1.7 uh, the fed will flirt in my view altering the duration of the qe they are spending 120 billion dollars a month um, i don't think we see any a uh, pedal of the accelerator on that at least till year end calendar year end right um and i think the market will grow increasingly suspicious of the fed's commitment uh, to continue with 120 billion beyond calendar year 2021 um and that will cause some jitters but that's probably at the end of this year right i think corporate earnings stay strong uh, in emerging markets uh, the magnitude of eps Uh, upside versus street expectations uh, in terms of developed markets is definitely due for a bit of a pullback, and earnings need to be realigned. Uh, I think they're running full steam in terms of expectations versus reality. But emerging markets uh, like India, I think uh, not only us but even global players are very very positive. Um, so bottom line is, you know, I think inflation isn't nearly as big a problem uh, as some of the present commentary that I'm I'm seeing in in you know not only in CNBC but even in the markets. Uh, i think yes there are some st- structural headwinds but uh, the markets have absorbed uh, the r- increase in rates pretty well so far and as i mentioned you know powell's testimony this week uh, only gives further confidence that uh, we might see some you know minor pullbacks uh, but is there a larger graver cause of concern uh, definitely not and to me i would summarize by saying that you know the three pillars of the rally in the last couple of months have been basically the strong earnings growth uh that we are seeing uh, not only in india but globally uh the vaccine improve, improvements and the stimulus unless we see a big pull back in either of these three uh you know markets will withstand the current bout of uh, scrutiny and should continue leading support to equity prices um i'm aware of the time so i'll stop here um devan uh, over to you might and sorry before uh, he takes over let me just introduce him uh, for people who may not be aware Uh, so shiv devan co heads our institutional equity platform uh, he's been uh, you know veteran in the markets uh, does a phenomenal job for us uh, has got some great insights in the markets and uh, he's also a part of uh, the investment committee and a portfolio manager in the equity portfolio so devan the floor is up to you whatever you want to speak about thanks shiv for that and uh, good evening to all of you uh, now that we have perspective on the markets and the uh, you know the i equity product which nitin and shiv have touched upon uh let me probably dive right into our process of selecting stocks uh, into the portfolio and you know that will probably give you ample clarity uh in terms of why certain stocks would uh, find a way into this portfolio um so of course uh, the usp of the iip portfolio has been the institutional research team uh you know which is which has been catering to local and international investors uh, for many years now uh and we have about 250 stocks under coverage uh which covers about 80% of the indian market cap resulting in in depth knowledge not only in these individual stocks but uh, even uh, you know the respective sectors which gives us very very good flavor in terms of uh, each sector and and how uh, and how a stock uh, you know would behave uh, <clears throat> our customized portfolio is uh, generally you know based on a few parameters and scorecards that we uh, create uh, and uh, you know I'll elaborate more on this in our stock selection process uh, but before that you know just to give you a sense our uh, our investable universe uh, for you know there are two portfolios the i equity core and the i equity growth Uh, for i equity core the investable universe is and uh, the nse 100 and for growth it is nse 200 and the idea is to you know completely invest in quality and not chase momentum for sure uh, it is you know we we intend to sort of buy and hold into a very concentrated portfolio for a long period of time uh, with very very low churn so typically you would always see uh, you know 15 to 20 stocks at best in the core and maybe about 20 25 stocks in growth uh, largely because of the mid cap flavor that we add into the growth portfolio uh the philosophy has been very simple a bottom up stock picking uh, and that's what we follow we do in depth analysis into each of these names uh, and then if it uh, meets our criteria that's how uh, we we get the stock into our portfolio um uh, the maximum stock exposure would be about 10% and to a sector would be about 40% though we don't decide uh, you know which sector we'd like to pick uh, we go uh, bottom up and uh, uh, and that's the way we try and uh, you know pick stocks we have no derivative exposure in either of these portfolios um and uh, you know just to give you a sense of uh, you know the the way we select stocks i think uh, there are uh, five parameters that we uh, sort of look at um, 
One is the fact that there has to be consistent earnings growth and uh, profitability. Uh, and what I mean is that, uh, you know, ROEs have to be very strong uh, and consistent 10 year sales and a better track record is something that we are very, very conscious about. Uh, you know, we pick companies that will focus, uh, you know, on the profit to cash flow conversion uh, and, and have low working capital and debt. Uh, we also look at certain other parameters like operating cash flows, promoter pledge, institutional ownership, all of that. But prim primary importance is earnings growth, profitability, and uh, and cash flow conversion. Uh, the second sort of parameter that we look at is uh, you know we prefer market leaders in every sector or category, uh, largely because uh, they've been there, done that. They have uh, you know they have multiple years of experience in that particular sector, and uh, uh, we are very comfortable uh, giving the kind of multiples that the market as, uh, the market ascribes uh, to these names. Uh, of course, uh, a very important parameter that we look at also is corporate governance and management quality. Uh, we like companies which are transparent and accountable. Uh, you know, we stick to promoters and managements who sort of allocate their capital wisely, you know, pay dividends uh, where there is excess cash. And rather than, you know, deploying it outside the core business, unless there is a very meaningful business case. Uh, lastly, of course, we have, uh, we also sort of have regular interactions with these managements, with other <coughs> economists, experts, uh, and, uh, you know, we try and, uh, you know, bring that into our, uh, into our uh, assessment of, of stocks. So even macro factors like liquidity rates, et cetera, will find a place. But, but finally, we also do a detailed final analysis, financial analysis. We have models, our own, uh, our own in-depth financial models for each company, which is updated on a regular basis. Uh, and, you know, those are the five parameters that we tend to look at, based on which if a stock meets all our criteria, uh, then we obviously add it into the portfolio. Uh, in the unlikely event of, uh, you know, any exception in the above parameters, uh, then there has to be a very valid reason for us to sort of add it into the portfolio, um, and, and, and which is something that we discuss in detail with the IC, uh, which meets uh, monthly. Uh, <clears throat> as you would have realized, uh, you know, uh, not only do we have a bottoms-up basis of uh, picking up our, uh, you know, our, our portfolio, but we do not start off with a sector selection. We see merit in each stock. Uh, and then uh, the outlook over the next few years, and that's how we pick it up. There, there might be a case where some sort of sectors may have a higher allocation than others, but that's purely because of the fact that uh, you know some of those stocks may be doing uh, better, and and that's the reason they find a place there. Uh, or, like I said, we do keep an eye on the allocation. I will not go over forty percent, uh, but uh, but you know, I mean, there are some sectors like banking, for example, where we have the largest weight. Uh, you know, some of the top quality, uh, you know, market cap and liquid companies form a part of that sector. Uh, it's uh, not only have they given handsome returns over the last, uh, you know, few, many years, uh, but even that, you know, India is a growing economy with growing banking needs for such a large population. Uh, growth should not be a concern in the sector. And hence, uh, you know, banks with great governance, risk practices uh, should do really well over time. And, and that's the reason, uh, you know, that we pick some of those names and, and that becomes a large wave. I think uh, we also have, uh, you know, reasonably large weights uh, when it comes to IT, uh, which is again uh, a, a sector that we are very, very positive on, um, and uh, you know, we believe that there is a mega technology upcycle that's underway, and uh, across the board, the IT companies, uh, you know, will will have will bear improvements because of that. Um, and of course, uh, one sector we can't, of course, avoid is consumption. Uh, for obvious reasons, we picked this in India as India is growing by leaps and bounds. And like we mentioned before, there is a huge population, uh, you know, that is making its way into the consuming middle class uh, and from the poor category. And hence, requirements in the sector will only increase steadily uh, over time. Um, you know, that's uh, in a nutshell, the way we go about our portfolio selection and our stock selection. Uh, of course, you would have seen uh, the, the kind of stocks that we have. They're absolutely blue, uh, you know, high quality blue chips that, uh, that we've uh, put into the portfolio. The idea is to hold on to them and uh, not, uh, not be looking to sell unless uh, they become meaningfully large uh, in the portfolio or uh, there is something that changes uh, in our investment uh, thought process. Uh, other than that, the idea is to have completely low churn. Um, so you'll obviously find the likes of HDFC and Asian Paints and Dr. Eddie's and the likes. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I, I think with that, let me end here and, uh, you know, would be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. <laughs>